Well, yeah, well, this is, this is the Death Star of Chickenden. Look at the size of that thing. What is it? This is, this is the pie machine which the Tweedies order, by mail order, really, and, and uh, have brought into their barn. <laughs> Mr Tweedy puts the whole thing together like a great big kind of Meccano set. I'll put it together then, shall I? And uh, it's just the most beautiful thing, you know. It's just a beautiful object. That's real craftsmanship is what it is. Um, made with incredible detail. I just love the colour scheme as well. It was, it was based on a sort of 1950s baking, sort of, sort of baking apparatus that you might get in a 1950s sort of bread factory or something. Imagine it. In less than a fortnight, every grocer's in the county will be stocked with box upon box of Mrs. Tweedy's homemade chicken pies. What, what's happening right now, then, is that Mr. Tweedy's coming in through the door, and as in, as in other forms of movies, the door isn't real, you know, so the door is a, is a fake foreground door. The camera is just seeing his back and the door opening, and as the door opens, it reveals the pie machine. Mrs. Tweedy, Mrs. Tweedy. So all this extraordinary lighting rig all this detail is just to reveal what the camera's going to see as this door opens. So, here's our film camera. Here's our model of Mr Tweedy. You can see he has no legs because um, the shot cuts off here so we don't see his legs. So it's convenient to have him on this thing. And this thing is designed to make him bounce up and down as if he's walking, without actually walking. And then, then our camera here, our film camera, um, Typically, it's kind of at his eye line or just below, slightly lower than his eye line. Because again, in real movies, you, you don't spend your whole time looking down on the sets. Um, because we're working with a model world, we think it's really important to bring the camera down right into the model world. That's part of the secret, really, I think, of creating the, the scale. <laughs> if you've got a great big set like this, it's diminished somehow if you're looking down on it. Yeah. It's, it's like I say, it's keeping on the eye line of the characters. It, it just makes it more somehow real and beautiful. Yeah, puts you in there, doesn't it? And then this camera's moving forward. So now again, if you see a live action movie, you'll see them pushing a camera forward on some rails. We have these rails uh, and it's motorized and controlled by computer. So that it can move in whatever fraction of an inch it is every frame in a very smooth and systematic way. As the camera goes in, perhaps it, it, it tilts again. There's a motor on here to tilt it, motor here. So the camera can do all the things that a regular camera can do, but um, all computer controlled and all in increments. So getting a camera move is extraordinarily difficult and slow. Every time the camera moves, will spend maybe a day, trying to, at least a day, trying to perfect it and get it to look organic. Mm -hmm. Pain is your friend, OK? It's a positive thing. Now, just keep the faith there. Uh, uh, what was your name? Agnes. Agnes. You, uh, you'll get there. Um, the, this camera is a film camera, quite old-fashioned film camera, uh, sturdy, solid as a rock. And on this side here, where you can't quite see, it, it has um, a video camera attached. And the video camera is looking through the, through the lens of the film camera, and that's what what we get on the, the TV monitor there. So the view on the monitor now is what is a, a video version of what we will see on film, ultimately. But each animator, as they're working, an animator standing here working on this puppet needs to be able to see what the camera's seeing. So uh, that's why the monitor is there. They can record, as Pete says, on, on the computer and see not only the camera move, but how the puppet's moving every frame in relationship to the camera. When we were starting out, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, there was you had to look through the camera every time to look, look at, to see what, the, what was going on film. Yeah. And even then, you know, you were stopped down so you couldn't really see, see very much. Uh, and then there was a slight advance of just having a video monitor. And uh, we were often drawing on the, on the video screen, you yeah. know, to, to track our movement. Um, or doing it the way, you know, Ray Harryhausen always did it, you know, just by just having a, a surface gauge which uh, pointed to a particular spot on the character and it, you'll be able to just track like the end of the nose of a character just to just to get the a sense of, of how far the character's moving per frame. Point is these things <sighs> take 
Hi. Which we are rapidly running out of. Certainly, all this equipment can be a hindrance to the animator. It can, <laughs> it can sometimes hinder spontaneity. But we're, we're constantly fighting that, you know, and our, our animators are so kind of well experienced on this movie. I, I think they, they, they are overcoming yeah, it. Yeah, the great, the great trick, given it is so slow, is to keep spontaneity. That, that probably above all, that's the real art of the animator. Because if you're doing an action which should take two seconds and it's taking you all day, you have to, you know, the, you have to be very skillful to keep it alive. Matt, you need those calculations quick. Uh -huh. As if that has to be really secure. Careful up there, Bala. Oh, God. Bunty, give him a hand. Well done, Babs. Keep it up. Another advantage we have over the, the world of uh, other movies is we have numerous versions of our stars. So there's Mr Tweedy there, going through the door, and, here, and here's another version of him. And I expect there are probably, there are probably ten more around the studio somewhere. I know just the one. Just demonstrating the whole, the whole principle of the thing. That, that this, we talk about animation and um, it taking a day to shoot two seconds. And basically the principle is very simple. This, this camera takes um, single film frames, and each single film frame is it worth one twenty-fourth of a second. Let's back up and start from the top. Basically, the animator moves the puppet and takes a frame, and that take a picture of that, and that is one twenty-fourth of a second. Move the puppet again, take another frame. Now you've got a whole twelfth of a second. It's nice to get a bit of time to yourself, isn't it? Move the puppet again and again, and now you've got a sixth of a second, I reckon. Anyway. The, the animator is going in and moving like this, and of course he's not just moving the arm like that, at the same time, the animator's moving the, he the head, you know, maybe the fingers, maybe the other arm, maybe even the whole body. Do all these things, and all these tiny movements put together, as we can see on the monitor, all these add up to uh, a smooth piece of animation when it's done properly. <laughs> For all animators, you know, uh, being able to just move the, the limbs is, uh, is, is one thing. I mean, that's technically how you do the animation, but the real, the real challenge to any of our animators is to somehow make that life seem like it's coming from the character itself. And it's, uh, you know, all the, they, have a, they have a puppet which is made of very inanimate materials, and so now the task for them is to give it that magic touch. And what we, what we found very important on this movie, although we've, we've had to go into other materials like uh, cloth and, and foam latex and silicon and all, all kinds of materials and hard materials so that so you can get hold of the puppet in places too, uh, but we've made sure that we keep all, on all the chickens and all the humans and, and the rats, we've, we've made sure that their, their limbs and their faces are kept as plasticine because those are the most expressive parts of the character. I'm sorry. Here I am, rambling on about hills and grass, and you had something you wanted to say. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it's just that, you know... And, uh, and after that, there's the face as well. You, you notice on here there's a great big crack down the side of Mrs Tweedy's face. And the reason for that is that that won't be seen eventually. The animator has to smooth out that, that crack every time. The reason it's there is because the way they talk is we have to replace the mouths every single frame as well. Um, for every syllable of every word. They don't plot, they don't scheme, and they are not organised! <laughs> order! Order! And it's a technique that we develop, developed after uh, the wrong trousers, in fact, yeah. I think. After, on a close shave, we had Wallace's... so that each animator could actually animate Wallace's mouth in the same style, so the style doesn't change. Yeah. We developed a system of taking their mouths off for every frame, and we have a whole set of them here, um, which... Um, as you can see from Mrs Tweedy, you have them all displayed up here. The different, the animator can just uh, go to the particularly particular syllable and, or consonant that they want. You know, like uh, for example, um, an O would be would be that shape, obviously. So you go go for this sort of thing. And there are different sizes of O's as well, which you can use. And um, this doesn't mean that um, 
if you wanted the character to say, oh, you, you wouldn't just stick that on and stay with it. You'd, you'd, you'd stick it on and, it, and, and then actually animate that slightly as well. So th these just give you your key positions, basically. And the animator would have to still make it have an organic feel once that's on. So it doesn't take anything away. It doesn't make it mechanical at all. Well, that's the challenge for the animator, to, to, to not make it feel mechanical. But we've always been egg farmers. My father and his father and all their fathers. There was always poor, worthless, nothings. But all that's about to change. This will take Tweedy's farm out of the Dark Ages and into full-scale automated production. When we started, we had even more... In fact, we tried things like, does she have a smiling set and the, and the snarling set? Um, it got too complicated and it was actually easier to let the animators take them and sculpt them through, as we say, sculpt them through. So you can, you can, and the fact the animators love doing it. You take one of these that's snarling, and then you model it on the puppet into a into a smile, um, because they, our animators end up being sculptors as well. That's part of the deal when they join. They have to be really, really good, careful with their hands, and you know, good. At, it's very fine modelling with the clay as well as acting, which is really what it's all about. The other thing we, we didn't talk about, which is so obvious, is the eyes, because I always think that um, half the animation, no, more, 80% you know, of the acting is done, I reckon, from the nose up. Um, and I won't demonstrate it to you, because I'll mess up the puppet, but, but you can just tweak, oh, just gently, you just gently tweak the eyebrow a little bit. And the smallest touch slightly affects the way you understand what he's thinking. And we, we spend a lot of time, whoop, gently, gently, working on um, the precise angle of the brows, which way the eyes are looking. Um, when the character's talking very sincerely to, to someone else, if the eyes start glancing away, it tells you something about what they're thinking. May maybe that they're dishonest, or maybe they're worried about something else. Attack! Huh? <laughs> so, so much of the acting is done, just in these two simple beads, which is all they are, and the, uh, and the brows. You're right, I mean, that is the most single, most important aspect of the whole movie, actually, is, is those close-ups of their faces. Yeah. All, the, all the reaction shots are so important, yeah. just knowing, knowing what they're thinking at any I point. I believe they are thinking something, yeah, not just... Because we, you know, people talk about animation, and when I demonstrate it, I demonstrate movement, but it's not... But movement isn't, is of secondary importance. You know, it's, it's making the character move isn't the interesting part, it's making the character live, which is what we're really trying to do. Yeah, it's the nuances. Yeah. And those are the bits where people, people think, yes, that, you know, that they can relate to that character, you know, where it has... The, that's what gives the character its human touch, I think, yeah. is, is, is the eye movement. Ladies, please, let's not lose our heads. Lose our heads? <laughs> so, yeah, so, so we've got, you know, the whole studio set up, now, lights, camera, action is done by the, the animator going in there and moving the puppet every frame. Um, when the animator's happy, then he goes across the computer and he starts, as I've demonstrated, going through the, going through the frames on this, recording it on, on the computer, getting happy with it. And when, then finally, when, when everything else is perfect and he's happy, he's got the animation perfect, nothing bad's happening, no lights have changed or anything. Then, then finally, the magic red button, the film button. It's a big moment, actually, it is. Every, every frame is a big moment, because all your, all your effort and attention, up to that moment, it's everything perfect. If it's perfect, take a frame, you know, and then it's recorded. Then it's, then it's safe in the magazine, you know, safe and stored, and um, you know, then, then you move on, start all over again. So every frame is like a, you know, a little miniature, story with it, yeah, of which this is the climax, the punchline. Yeah.